Hi, and welcome to the session. I'm Dr. Michael Houston, and today we'll be talking about epidemiology and risk factors in child and adolescent psychiatry. I'm a professor of psychiatry and pediatrics at the George Washington University Medical Center in Washington, D.C. There are four main topics I hope to cover today. First, the epidemiology of child and adolescent mental illness. Then the concept of burden of disease and how it relates to psychiatric illness in children. Thirdly, we'll discuss the major risk factors for mental illness in children and adolescents. And then lastly, the important topic of protective factors. Epidemiology is the science that looks at the patterns and diseases in populations, how often they occur, where they occur, and in whom. It also looks at the causes and effects of illnesses. All this is done in an attempt to understand a disease condition and to limit its impact. Two of the more important concepts in epidemiology are incidence and prevalence. Using these concepts together with the analyzing data that can be collected, we can understand how fast a disease is occurring in a specific group of children and adolescents, whether the rate is increasing or decreasing, and what effects our interventions are having, especially if those interventions are aimed at the population as a whole. For example, screening teenagers with depression and then intervening with a group of adolescents towards identifying symptoms of depression and promoting positive health behaviors. Incidence is the measure of the probability of the occurrence of an illness in a population within a specific period of time. We can express it as the number of new cases divided by the number of people being studied. An extremely simple example, if you worked in a city with 100 adolescents and during the previous year, 10 of them were duly diagnosed with depression, you would say that the incidence of depression among adolescents is 10 divided by 100, or 10%. Using incidence as a measure allows one to look at whether an illness is occurring more or less frequently in a given period of time. If accurate, it also allows us to predict how many new cases of an illness we could expect to develop within a given period of time. Prevalence, on the other hand, is a measure of the proportion of cases in a population at a given time not the rate of occurrence of new cases. So, in your fictional city, you were to look now at how many of your 100 adolescents currently had depression and found that 17 met the diagnosis, you would have a prevalence of depression of 17%, or 17 divided by 100. Rather than being a measure of the rate of occurrence, prevalence is more a measure of the overall number of cases at a given time, which reflects to some degree the burden of disease within a community. Saying it a different way, incidence conveys information of how the, about the risk of contracting the disease, where prevalence indicates how widespread the disease is. The difficulty comes in actually trying to determine the incidence and prevalence in a given country or area. Studies are often quite expensive, and obtaining accurate numbers based on surveys of children and or their parents are often difficult to arrange. Most of the well-documented studies have been done in developed countries, and while we often try to extrapolate from these studies in more developed areas, we are only getting a rough approximation. Another approach is to look at all the studies done, or as many as possible, and using analytic techniques to arrive at more accurate numbers. This is generally thought to give us more specific approximations. Even with these problems, these concepts can be used on smaller scales, like our fictional city with 100 adolescents, to determine, to determine how much of a problem a given illness or illnesses may be causing, and how effective our interventions are. So, if we turn now to look at what the prevalence of psychiatric illness is among children and adolescents, we get numbers that look like this. Saying there is an overall prevalence of 20% shows how extensive emotional and behavioral issues are among children and adolescents, one out of every five children. There is not a standard definition across communities for serious emotional disturbance, but it begins to include children and adolescents whose psychiatric illness is so profound that it prevents them from attending or participating in school, social, or family life. It might represent untreated depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, or psychosis, or a combination of disorders that present with significant behavioral and or learning problems. 10% that's an extremely significant number and underscores how disruptive most psychiatric illness is to an individual child's life. Across cultures, it appears that anxiety disorders 
are quite prevalent and usually rank among the highest in prevalence. Also are different disruptive behavior patterns. Moving on to the measures of disease burden. I don't think you would be participating in this course if you didn't already have some idea of how much psychiatric illness affects the lives of children and adolescents, or how prevalent they are throughout the world. When we try to measure the effect of a disease across the lifespan in terms of the lost productivity, the lost happiness, and the loss of life itself, we're talking about disease burden. Two frequently used measures of disease burden are qualities and dailies. I'm not going to go into how these measures are calculated because I think it is more important to just have a notion of what they are about. A quality-adjusted life year takes into account both the quantity and quality of life generated by healthcare interventions. It's the product of life expectancy and a measure of the quality of the remaining life years. Daily is perhaps a more important notion. It's an abbreviation for disability-adjusted life year. It is a universal metric that allows researchers and policymakers to compare very different populations and health conditions across time. Dailies equal the sum of years of life lost and years lived with disability. One daily equals one lost year of a healthy life. Dailies allow us to estimate the total number of years lost due to a specific cause and risk factors at country, regional, and global levels. Awareness of these measures can help one to persuade policymakers regarding where to direct resources. It's only been in the last decade or so that the worldwide burden of psychiatric illness has been fully recognized. This chart, this table, is from the work of Helmut Remschmidt and Myron Belfort, who have been instrumental in bringing together the evidence regarding the impact of mental health on the children and adolescents across the world. The table expresses disability-adjusted life years, or the years of healthy life lost, based on three different conditions, neuropsychiatric, cancers, and cardiovascular disease. What it tells us is that 25%, or one quarter of the years of life lost to disease across the world, are due to neuropsychiatric conditions, and that half of all those years are lost from conditions that begin before the age of 20. If we further break down where the years of life are lost, mental health, mental health and substance abuse account for 184 million disability-adjusted life years. By comparison, cardiac disease accounts for approximately 90 million disability-adjusted life years. Looking at the numbers below, we see depression and, substitu- and substance abuse alone account for 60% of the morbidity and mortality we see in psychiatric illness throughout the world. Moving on to our third topic, risk factors. We're often encouraged to think about illness in the biopsychosocial model, and that's particularly fitting in talking about risk factors and protective factors. Awareness of these helps both in identifying children who are specifically at risk for mental illness and also looking for resiliency in children to help them overcome the negative risks they face. In looking and thinking about these, keep in mind that these risk factors are for all mental illness in a general way. When thinking about any specific illness, that may have its own list of risks specific to that illness. First, looking at biological risk factors, both before and after birth. Certainly before birth, genetics plays a fundamental role, both in regards to risk and protective factors. Exposure to toxins before and after birth need to be considered. Malnutrition is a major risk factor, especially in the younger child. And then HIV and physical illnesses have profound effects on children. The psychological factors affecting a child's development include the child's temperament. Uh, we know children with difficult temperaments are more prone to abuse, and they have a greater incidence of learning problems, and are at risk for disruptive behavior disorders, depression, and substance abuse. Any sort of abuse, of course, physical, sexual, emotional, is correlated with emotional and psychiatric illness. And of course, self-esteem issues and cognitive impairments also create risk for mental illness. Social factors have a great impact on a child's life and their risk of developing mental illness. We can divide these factors um, into those that arise within the family, like parenting styles or the level of conflict in the family. Certainly the death of a child's caregiver has long been associated with depression in children 
and then drug and alcohol use by the caretaker puts the child at risk for abuse, but also for a number of different psychiatric illnesses. Within schools, academic issues lead to self-esteem problems, as does bullying, which has been identified as a major risk factor for the development of depression and other psychiatric illness. And then failure of a school to recognize a child's unique needs, uh, specifically learning needs, leads to the child feeling isolated and then falling behind academically. Again, it starts a cascade of problems with the child's self-esteem, which can lead to depression. Lastly, in thinking about the community, a high level of disorganization, violence, or being a member of a group that is discriminated against all are correlated with higher incidences of mental illness. Lastly, um, in the next few slides, we're going to look at some of the protective factors um, that children uh, can be exposed to that might uh, mitigate or reduce the risk of the development of psychiatric illness. Uh, these carry with them as a great deal of importance as they often help to point the way towards helping an otherwise vulnerable child. In the biological sphere, we know that normal development, normal intellect, and good physical health can protect a child from the detrimental factors that might lead to psychiatric illness. We can also use some of these factors to promote mental health. For instance, psychologically, we focus on developing a child's self-esteem or promoting better social skills. We know this will lead to protecting them from the effects of an otherwise negative environment. And then finally, looking at social factors. Here we have, I think, the list of activities and behaviors that we'd want to promote in every family and community. Strengthening the child's attachment to his or her family, actively engaging the child in a strong, supportive educational environment, and working to promote a sense of the child's living within an active, healthy community. All these things have been shown to have a positive impact on mental health and development. Lastly, I want to take a look at this interesting figure. It's from the work of Christian Kiesling and his colleagues. I think it brings together the many risks that occur across developmental stages. In the center are those factors like genetics that affect the individual across their lifespan. Then beginning at the top are the fact factors prior to conception, followed clockwise by the prenatal factors, like inadequate perinatal care. Spend some time studying the chart. While well, doing so, think not just of the risks at each stage of development, but also of the potential for intervening at each point in the life cycle. Well, that finishes my presentation. Thank you for your attention. I hope you found this information helpful. Below is a list of articles that can be found on the internet that contain other interesting and I hope helpful material. Thank you.